what they call response to intervention, or RTI, if you're familiar with that. And the, under that, the idea is to regularly do progress monitoring and pick up when a child is struggling with reading so that that child can get immediate intervention. And so generally, I, the idea is the lowest 30% of the class will get extra help. And of that group that's getting extra help, another 30%, the lowest 30% of that probably qualifies for special education, so we don't need to wait. Now, the problem is um, school districts don't necessarily uh, do a good job with response to intervention. Some do, and, uh, and it's, but a lot don't know how to implement it and so on, um, which, is, which is a shame. Also, diagnosing uh, di a formal diagnosis by a, 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 in a psychoeducational assessment does require some, a, uh, some ability and achievement gap to have that. So um, we need, a, you know, the intent of the 2004 uh, reauthorization of IDA was to provide more flexibility like that. But there's still you know, we still have standard deviation differences and years, and uh, it's not it's not it's not as clear and well implemented as it could be. Yes. You know, my understanding of legislation also is that it's not um, that the public schools are not required to maximize a child's potential. Right. But they are required to provide an adequate education. Yes. So that I think that leaves a lot of families. Yes, yeah. exactly. And yes, nothing. that's right. An adequate education, and what's that? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But um, I think forward-looking school districts, and more and more this is happening, especially in the early grades. Response to intervention was really designed to prevent reading problems and maybe math problems in young children. People at the secondary level have a really hard time knowing what in the world to do with response to intervention at those levels, but we won't go there tonight. Um, so, um, Reed Lyon, who uh, <clears throat> was the who sort of the was the head of the National Institutes for Child Health Development, who conducted a 30-year study of um, of children, prospective study of 40,000 children in 45 countries, or 35,000 children in 40 countries with fMRIs and for years, so that he was able to determine, uh, uh, he and, and a host of researchers were able to really determine what, uh, what good readers do, what happens to poor readers, uh, what's going on in their brains, what effective intervention is and what ineffective intervention <coughs> is by following these children over the years. He found that, um, and this was as of the late 90s, and I don't really think it's changed all that much in 20 years, uh, that 59 or 15 years or whatever, 59% of fourth grade children had little or no mastery of the skills necessary to read at the fourth grade level, which is pretty horrible. 71% of African Americans were below grade level. Um, and <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's a crisis. That was um, in California. And California, this is California, and this was basically this was looking, I think, at California. 81% uh, of Hispanics were below grade level in reading, 23% of Asians below grade level of reading, 44% of white students. One of the things, guess what California legislated back in the late 80s? California mandated by law schools had to, uh, had to use a whole language approach to teaching, reading, and writing. Now, I, whole language 
you know, we need whole language in some areas. It, it promotes imagination, it provides rich literature experiences, but it do, as it is, has been implemented in the United States, it does not provide careful, scientifically based reading instructions. So what happened to California was the reading scores just like fell off a cliff. So right away, you know, so then the legislature had to redo that and now they're supposed to teach phonics and things like that. But uh, in the meantime, just, you know, millions of children, school children, suffered because of a belief system that just simply wasn't correct. And I think one of the most frustrating things to me as an educator is the extent to which educators cling to belief systems and won't look at hard research, which is getting increasingly uh, more better, you know, as, as time goes on. And that I don't understand. I really don't. Um, yeah, and the other thing that happened uh, as a result of this, 49% of fourth grade children were reading below basic levels, and they came from homes where parents had graduated from college. So this would be from enriched language uh, background. Um, and, you know, we've got fairly dismal, uh, we continue to have fairly dismal uh, reading scores um, <clears throat> on our national assessment of educational progress, though, the fourth grade level has gone up some. What we're not seeing is enough growth in the eighth and twelfth grade levels. So that's um, so. Consequently, we're working really hard to improve our adolescent literacy programs for older students. Um, and um, what uh, what what happens? You know, again, when you look at the outcomes of people who don't learn to read, what you see is, you know, if you look at our prison population, probably as much as 70% of them have a learning disability and don't, uh, can't read well. And, uh, and you know, and, 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 and then many of those, <coughs> uh, and I would suggest that the other 30% probably have ADHD with a conduct disorder, you know. So anyway, the consequences, economic consequences of uh, failure to learn to read are severe. It, it, and that's because our, our economy, you know, we have an information age economy. A hundred years ago, not such a big deal if you didn't learn to read, you know. And... Uh, for many, many years of human history, reading was really not required to be able to earn a, a, a sustainable living. But it is now. And so consequently, we're, um, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're facing a huge challenge. Um, and uh, I actually didn't really know this, but southern states are planning for future prison growth by looking at illiteracy rates in middle school students. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, <clears throat> it's a situation not unlike our healthcare situation, that, you know, we, we, want, we, 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 ought, we want to look at spending a few dollars for primary care and primary intervention as opposed to lots of money down the road for the consequences of uh, poor health, obesity, and, you know, similarly not learning to read. So, um, the next question, of course, gets to be is, how do we, who is at risk for dyslexia? How do we know? Well, dyslexia does, turns out to have a significant genetic component. So, if uh, a child has a family history of delayed speech and language development or relatives who have been, who have had difficulty learning to read, um, then there, there's a higher likelihood that uh, a child will inherit that. 
because this is a genetically, uh, this does transfer by genes and the genes have been even located in the Human Genome Project. If though uh, there's a child who by age four cannot rhyme, cannot come up with, uh, you know, cannot pick out a word, you know, when given a choice, what rhymes with ham and then, you know, uh, fat, fan, Sam, and they can't pick that out. That's a 